patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation and what are the challenges and what does protection mean to them? Uh, this is a typical patient I think we all see. His name is Amin. His kidney function is deteriorating. He's concerned. He's 76 years age, so older. He has non-valvular atrial fibrillation, diabetes, and moderate renal impairment. And when you see him in the clinic, he's concerned. His friend had a stroke uh, and needs a caretaker each day. And obviously that's a, a fear many patients have. He, he also ended up on dialysis and we know patients with diabetes and CKD, it's the number one cause of dialysis and certainly avoiding transplant or dialysis is a huge concern for these patients. So they obviously are, have multiple comorbidities and they want protection from all of those. We know this issue of kidney disease is particularly important in diabetics because it's common one in three patients with diabetes have kidney disease, it's the major cause of dialysis or transplantation. And not only does it increase their risk of stroke from atrial fibrillation, but increases their cardiovascular risk broadly. Uh, and patients with diabetes are much more likely to die of cardiovascular disease than their age matched peers. Uh, and obviously Amin's older, he's 76 years old, and we know there's a significant association between the risk of stroke from atrial fibrillation and age, it's such that once you become an 80 year old, you're, if you're not on a blood thinner, your risk of having a stroke is about 25% per year. Obviously when you talk about stroke prevention, you know, there are a lot of things you have to consider. We, we tend to focus in atrial fibrillation on anticoagulation and that's certainly an important piece. But remember, there are other risk factors for stroke. You wanna control their hypertension, get them to stop smoking if they're smoking. Diabetes obviously increases their risk of stroke independent of atrial fibrillation. And of course, we know having blockages in, in brain arteries or carotid arteries increases the risk of atherosclerotic stroke. And so certainly managing their cholesterol in all patients who are, who are diabetics uh, obviously have an indication for, for high intensity statin therapy. You know, and, and the issue with patients like Amin is all of these things work together. We know just by having atrial fibrillation, on average, your risk of stroke is five times that of the general population. But diabetes, in addition to atrial fibrillation, increases that risk one and a half to twofold. And once you have chronic kidney disease, it further increases your risk 30 to 60 percent. We know that there's this inextricable link between diabetes, cardiovascular risk, and renal function. Uh, diabetes is the leading cause of CKD, which I mentioned, and that increases the risk of stroke and bleeding. And overall, though, remember diabetics and kidney disease have an increase of all cause mortality, including CV death. And you see here out of a large US database, the uh, NHANES survey, you see in dark blue total mortality and light blue CV mortality. Um, that the 10 year rates of total mortality or CV mortality are increased in diabetics. They're increased in patients with CKD. And if you have both, at 10 years, you have a one in three chance of dying. And two thirds of those deaths are due to a cardiovascular cause. Let's talk a little bit about the age-related risk of stroke. I mentioned Amin is 76, so he's certainly on the older spectrum. We have a lot of data that patients who are older in their late 70s, 80s, even 90s, uh, they're not only out there at the highest risk of stroke, uh, but they actually derive the greatest absolute benefit from being on a blood thinner, yet routinely all over the world, these patients, uh, anticoagulation is withheld due to the fear of bleeding. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but we have good clinical trial and real world data that supports anticoagulation in these groups. If we look at the greater than 75 or 75 years of age subgroup in Rocket, we see there's a 20% reduction in stroke and systemic embolism, no increase in major bleeding. Um, numerically less fatal bleeding, uh, as well as intracranial hemorrhage. So at least in the clinical trials supports that we should be anticoagulating these patients. If you look at real world data, which I think is an important complement to clinical trial data, obviously people sometimes criticize clinical trials that they're an idealized world. They tend to enroll uh, healthier patients. And many of us who see patients in practice say, I have a lot of patients who wouldn't qualify for a trial. Uh, we do have a lot of large AF registries. These are the prefer uh, in AF and prolongation registries. Looking at older patient subgroup again, we see very similar results. This is for all NOACs, about a 30% reduction in major bleeding 
and ischemic events. So I think the real world data and clinical trial data really support anticoagulation, particularly with NOAX uh, in these high risk patients. If you look at the specific uh, 10A or 2A inhibitors, again, from the prefer and prolongation registries, we see here that rivaroxaban significantly less uh, net composite major bleeding and ischemic events, a uh, 50, a 42% reduction that was statistically significant, uh, and trends for dabigatran and apixaban of about 30% of the did not reach uh, statistical significance for those individual comparisons. Of course, anytime you give a blood thinner, it's a double-edged sword. You, you want to prevent stroke, but you certainly don't want to cause serious bleeding. And again, we have reassuring data um, from the Saphir uh, AC prospective study, which I'll note was not only enrolling patients in their 70s, but actually enrolled patients in their 80s. And this was a, a study out of France. The mean age of this population was 86. Very high Chad's VAS score, about 4.6. And remember, a lot of times patients are in their late 80s, 90s. People won't anticoagulate these patients at all due to the fear of bleeding. But we see here for rivaroxaban compared to vitamin K antagonists, there's almost a 50% reduction in major bleeding, uh, a 60% reduction in intracranial hemorrhage, although non-significant, at least uh, you know almost a 40% reduction in stroke, and just missed statistical significance for a 20% reduction in mortality. So I think this should give a lot of confidence that we should be anticoagulating patients who are elderly. There really is no age cutoff for anticoagulation. These patients are at the highest absolute risk of stroke. And if you use a NOAC in this data, we have a particularly robust amount of data for rivaroxaban. It shows that it is quite safe to anticoagulate these patients. Now let's talk a little bit about diabetes. Um, diabetes are challenging because diabetics have increased risk, not just of stroke, if they have atrial fibrillation, but they have increased risk of cardiovascular events, MI, non-cardiobolic stroke, such as large vessel stroke. They obviously have risk of amputation from their PAD. And of course, because of the microvascular disease, they're at risk for retinopathy and blindness, as well as renal impairment, which I mentioned. And diabetics are obviously, they are concerned about all of these things. So what is the data that we have that selection of particular agents may allow protection from a variety of these adverse outcomes. Now, one thing I will point out for diabetics is that they did have the greatest representation in the Rocket AF study because they Rocket enrolled really the highest risk patients. The CHAD score in Rocket AF was 3.7. It was only about two for Aristotle and Rely and about 2.8 for Engage. About 40% of patients in the Rocket AF trial were diabetic. And I think it's a large subgroup and we're reassured in the Rocket AF diabetic subgroup that there was about a 20% reduction, although not significant in the individual subgroup for stroke or systemic embolism. And there was no increased risk of major bleeding and numerically less intracranial hemorrhage. Now, one of the things that's also important that I mentioned is diabetics certainly are at risk of stroke, but they're also at risk of increased vascular death or cardiovascular death. And if you look at the diabetic subgroup Overall, in the Rocket AF trial, we see that there was a 20% significant reduction in vascular mortality. If you compare that to other NOAC trials here, again, Rocket, as well as Aristotle with the Pixaban and the Bigatran with Rely, we see that if we look at cardiovascular death in particular, we see this significant 20% reduction in CV death. Um, and less significant trends in both Aristotle and Rely, which, as you know, had two doses of the bigger trend. And so at least given support that obviously overall, uh, the, the class of NOACs are effective in diabetics, but this particular finding of decreased cardiovascular death uh, was most robust, at least in the Rocket AF study. You know, one of the interesting things is obviously patients with um, diabetes are at a high risk of other types of adverse events, including, as I mentioned, major adverse cardiovascular events, so MI and stroke more broadly, as well as limb events, uh, because we know diabetes is a big driver of polyvascular disease, in particular peripheral arterial disease. And we know major adverse limb events, which can acute acute limb events, a chronic limb ischemia, um, as well as amputation. And we know rivaroxaban, although at other doses in non-AF patients, is very effective in reducing 
uh, recurrent cardiovascular events and limb events. So what about using the AF dose, so the higher dose, 20 milligrams or dose reduced to 15 in patients who not only have atrial fibrillation, but happen to have diabetes? Do they also enjoy that same protection, not just for stroke, but for adverse cardiovascular and limb events? We do have some real world data to inform us. This is from the US Truven Market Scan database, looking at a large number of patients who were started on rivaroxaban or warfarin. And we see here again, looking at major adverse cardiac acid events more broadly, that there was a significant 25% reduction in MACE with similar trends for ischemic stroke and MI. And again, a very significant 43%, I mean, 63% reduction in major adverse limb events with marked reductions in major limb amputation as well as endovascular revascularization. And so obviously we're prescribing the anticoagulant to reduce stroke, but by giving them, in this case, rivaroxaban, we are also protecting them uh, from the risk of MI, uh, the risk of non-cardioembolic stroke, so a stroke due to non-AF causes, and also limb events. And, and we know patients, particularly those patients with overt peripheral arterial disease, they have very high rates of limb amputation, revascularization, uh, et cetera. Obviously, we always need to balance that with the risk of bleeding. And again, reassuringly, like you've seen now multiple times in these high-risk subgroups, there is no excess in major bleeding in these patients with diabetes, and they do enjoy this usually significant reductions in intracranial bleeding. Um, there, there is good data for the other agents as well. Um, the most common, probably other agents worldwide, is apixaban. We see if we look from the Aristotle trial and their diabetic subgroup um, that the results are fairly similar with respect to stroke <laughs> in diabetics and non-diabetics. There is this interesting finding that we know that overall, uh, apixaban is associated with a significant decrease in bleeding, but there is statistical heterogeneity in diabetics where diabetic patients seem to enjoy less benefit for, on the bleeding perspective um, compared to non-diabetics. So non-diabetics still have that significant reduction in bleeding with the Pixaban compared to warfarin, but for whatever reason in the diabetic subgroup, there appears to be no difference in bleeding uh, for Pixaban and for warfarin. It's not quite known why uh, this interaction occurs. It, it has also been seen in another trial with the Pixaban um, with AF and uh, Q-coronary syndrome or PCI. Uh, so it has been seen in multiple data sets, but it's not clear why we see this heterogeneity with apixaban in particular. I do want to spend a good amount of time on renal impairment, partly because it's so common and such a cause of concern in physicians treating patients with atrial fibrillation. And we know because renal impairment, uh, if you have moderate to severe CKD, you're at very high risk of stroke, very high risk of bleeding, very high risk of progressing to end-stage renal disease. Um, and so, this is a big issue because patients with atrial fibrillation are older and have a lot of comorbidities. So about 65% of them have renal impairment. And we know that that increases your risk of dying as well as having a stroke or bleeding. Now, after the NOAC trials were um, developed, there's been some interest that actually it may be beneficial to give a patient a NOAC rather than warfarin to prevent further renal decline. It's really interesting. There had been a concern that because the NOACs were renally clear and warfarin's not, warfarin's metabolized by the liver, that warfarin would be safer in patients with renal impairment. That turns out to be not true at all. Uh, that even as you go down to a creatinine clearance of 15 or so, um, that the NOAC safety advantage, 50% less severe life-threatening bleeding uh, is the same in patients with moderate uh, CKD. Um, but there actually is a reason to avoid warfarin in these patients because warfarin, it turns out, actually accelerates renal decline. This has been known actually for a long time. If you look at cohorts who are given a vitamin K antagonist compared to age match controls who are not, they have a decline in their GFR. Uh, even as early as a couple of years after initiating therapy. And that actually matches if you look at arterial calcification, the longer you're on warfarin, the more arterial calcification you have. And there's actually a, a basic science mechanism for this. And it's because vitamin K antagonists promote medial and intimal calcification in the vessel wall. There's a protein called matrix GLA protein or, or MGP. MGP inhibits 
vessel calcification. So you don't want vessel calcification, that's bad. That usually leads in the kidney arteries at least to worsen the kidney function. In order for this MGP protein to be active, it has to undergo vitamin K dependent carboxylation. So if you're on a vitamin K antagonist, such as warfarin, you're gonna prevent MGP from being active. If MGP is not active, you can't inhibit vascular calcification. And that's the mechanism why warfarin and other vitamin K antagonists accelerate renal decline. And this is actually, you know, that's the basic science, but you know, does, the, does this bear out when you look at kidney outcomes? And there's a very nice study by Yao et al based on the Medicare database in the United States that looked at whether warfarin compared to the NOAX accelerates renal decline. And so they looked at renal outcomes. Again, we're not looking at stroke, we're not looking at MI, we're looking at kidney outcomes, looking at 30% decline in GFR, a doubling of the creatinine, acute kidney injury, kidney failure. And we noticed that there's a significant amount of adverse renal events happening, you know, a significant proportion having declines in GFR and almost 50% developing acute kidney injury and almost 2% developing kidney failure. And interestingly, the NOACs are renal protective compared to warfarin. We see here a 23% reduction in, if you use the 30% decline in GFR, so less patients having that significant decline in GFR, almost a 40% reduction in the doubling of serum creatinine, and over a 30% decrease in acute kidney injury. So again, not only should, you know, is it okay to use NOACs in patients with CKD, um, but actually, you want to use them preferentially because if you stick with warfarin, you're going to accelerate their decline in their GFR, and they're more likely going to go out and end up on dialysis. Again, I showed you data for the NOAX overall. This is data just for rivaroxaban, and you see here, again, very robust reductions in these hard uh, renal outcomes. And this data is so compelling that actually, at least in the U.S. guidelines in 2019, uh, included uh, text to say over time, no acts. And the data is particularly strong for dabigatran and rivaroxaban that we should preferentially be using these drugs because they're associated with lower risks of adverse renal outcomes than warfarin in patients with atrial fibrillation. And this is a big deal um, because, you know, I showed you that diabetics have a lot of CKD. Um, and so, you know, not only do they have CKD, but they're also much more likely to, pro to progress to dialysis. And so preventing renal decline over many years that these patients will be on therapy is incredibly important. <laughs> and I showed you data from the U.S. There's very similar data out of Europe. Um, these is a retrospective German insurance claim database study reloaded, again, looking at patients with atrial fibrillation and renal disease, and looking at the endpoints of acute kidney injury, end-stage renal disease, and dialysis. And again, a very similar story. Here, NOAC versus fenprocumin. We look at rivaroxaban and apixaban, looking at reductions in end-stage renal disease and acute injury, a very similar across uh, the two 10A inhibitors here. And again, if you look at patients with diabetes, who, as we know, often have uh, kidney disease, again, we see very significant reductions for end-stage renal disease for both, significant reductions in acute kidney injury for rivaroxaban, although at least in diabetics, we did not see the same reduction in acute kidney injury um, with apixaban. And then uh, looking at slightly more advanced renal disease in the caliper study here, starting with patients with stage three or stage four kidney disease, looking at an endpoint of whether they're progressing to stage five kidney disease, kidney failure, or the need to dialysis, Again, when you look at this retrospective study, as far as progressing to renal disease, we see here favors a rivaroxaban. Whether you look at patients with stage three or four CKD due to non-diabetic cause or patients with CKD who have diabetes, again, you see about a 50% reduction uh, in progression of their renal disease to end-stage renal disease or dialysis. So showing even in very advanced kidney disease by using a drug such as rivaroxaban, you could prevent them from progressing to end-stage renal disease. Now, the question always comes up, well, that's great um, for patients with advanced kidney disease, stage three, stage four, but the clinical trials did not include patients with a creatinine clearance less than 15, uh, and many labels 
of these drugs, the 10A inhibitors, particularly throughout the world, don't you know sort of have any language about what to do when a patient develops end-stage renal disease or needs renal replacement therapy such as dialysis. I will say that although we don't have a clinical trial in this area, there has been a lot of use of the 10A inhibitors uh, in dialysis in the United States. Uh, and that's probably our biggest database. So if you look um, in the United States, mostly out of the Medicare database, which are patients 75 or older, they have a lot of comorbidities, it's a very good database. We see, interestingly, that in dialysis patients, um, there's a 45% reduction in stroke compared to warfarin. Now, it doesn't reach statistical significance, but I think at least trending in the right direction. And for major bleeding, there's a 32% significant reduction in bleeding. So all of this concern about, well, the, the NOACs are renally cleared, you know, it's not safe to use them in patients with end-stage renal disease. This data says that that's not true. These drugs, particularly rivaroxaban and pixaban, are minimally renally cleared. And if you measure drug levels in dialysis patients, they're actually similar to drug levels in patients with only mild CKD. Um, and then that translates when you look at clinical outcomes, you know, the 10A inhibitors are safer with respect to bleeding compared to warfarin, and that's even true in dialysis patients. And I think this is why, at least in the United States, there's been increasing use of the 10A inhibitors in patients with dialysis. If you look, you know, obviously the, the two agents that are least renally cleared, as I mentioned, are rivaroxaban and apixaban. If you look in the same database, uh, comparing them, that I showed you rivaroxaban versus warfarin, you see uh, they look very similar. There's almost identical reductions in stroke uh, as well as major bleeding. And so there doesn't appear in dialysis patients, at least, to be any difference between these two 10A inhibitors. And that's why at least the Food and Drug Administration and the FDA actually harmonized or made similar the labels for pixaban and rivaroxaban, allowing them to potentially be used in end-stage renal disease. Obviously, if you're doing that for rivaroxaban, because their creatinine clearance is less than 50, and it's straightforward dosing for rivaroxaban, they'd be on the 15. It's actually a little bit more complicated for a pixaban because remember, you need two or three dosing criteria. And so if renal function, even if you have end-stage renal disease, is only one of your factors, your age is still less than 80, your body weight's above 60 kilograms, theoretically, you would actually get the five milligrams twice daily uh, and not the 2.5. So there's a lot more, I think, uncertainty around what's the ideal pixaban dose in that stage renal disease. But certainly for rivaroxaban in the US, everybody would be using uh, the 15. This issue about dosing is really incredibly important. Um, and I mentioned this because underdosing is very common. Um, why do people underdose? Well, they may not know the dose criteria. <laughs> Pretty straightforward, I'd say for most of them, except for apixaban. Um, so maybe they get it wrong. But the more common reason probably is you have an elderly patient in front of you, they have comorbidities, they fell before, you think they're frail. You want to anticoagulate them because you don't want them to have a stroke, but you don't want them to bleed. And so you intentionally, and we all do this, give them the lower dose, even though they don't qualify for a dose reduction, because you want to give them some protection from stroke, but you want to decrease their rate of bleeding. Well, does that strategy work? It turns out, unfortunately, it does not. This is again out of the Mayo Clinic looking at the Medicare database, we see here the most underdose and the most data we have is for Pixaban because if you follow the package insert or the label for Pixaban, only about 4% of your patients would receive the lower dose of a Pixaban, 2.5 milligrams, similar to what was in the Aristotle trial. But if you look in the United States, and I'm sure if you look in Egypt, Europe, anywhere else in the world, you see about 40% of patients are on the lower dose of a Pixaban, <coughs> usually inappropriately so. It turns out that giving a patient who doesn't meet dose reduction criteria a lower dose of the drug, you do not get less bleeding, which is surprising, right? That's your whole reason for giving the lower dose. What does that tell you? That means that bleeding is much more related to the patient's characteristics than which dose of the anticoagulant you give them. Um, but by giving them a dose, in this case, a pixaban, half the dose, right? 2.5 instead of five there was a five-fold increased risk in stroke. Remember, five-fold means a 500% increase in stroke. So if you do that to enough patients, you're gonna have a patient who suffers a preventable stroke. So if you're going to use a NOAC, make sure you use 
the correct dose and don't use fear of bleeding to either withhold the anticoagulant or to cause you to use the inappropriate dose. And this is why there's been a lot of controversy about bleeding risk scores. And we have bleeding risk scores. We have HasBled. We now have ABC bleeding risk score. They were actually in the guidelines initially, then they got dropped from a lot of guidelines. And then where we've ended up is they're, they're useful in identifying modifiable risk factors. But the danger in giving someone a bleeding risk score is physicians tend to use it as a reason to withhold anticoagulation. And that should never be. Statistically, and we've actually modeled this with statisticians out of Harvard University and MIT, that with atrial fibrillation patients, you can't find patients at low enough risk of stroke and high enough risk of bleeding that they don't still benefit from anticoagulation. So you should almost never withhold anticoagulation due to bleeding risk. There are very specific exceptions to that, maybe spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage or something like that. But far too often we use, oh, they have a high has blood score, they had a GI bleed before as a reason to withhold potentially life-saving therapy. Remember, when you use the Hazlitt score, there are a number of modifiable uh, aspects to it, obviously not age, uh, but say hypertension. Well, hypertension is not just having a history of hypertension, control their blood pressure. Your risk of bleeding with systolic blood pressure of 120 is much lower than if someone has systolic blood pressure of 180. Obviously, we know if they're on a single antiplatelet agent or they're on a, a a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory that you increase their risk of bleeding by 50%. So if they don't need that ibuprofen or they don't need the aspirin or clopidogrel, stop it. Uh, we certainly know that heavy alcohol use is also associated with bleeding. And this real nice study at Exantis, which is a prospective registry study with rivaroxaban, we see that um, patients with modifiable risk factors, um, their risk of, of major bleeding was uh, significantly higher, about twofold. And so just use the Hazlitt score as a, a way to remind you that, hey, there are some things I can do to lower this patient's risk of bleeding, but don't use a Hazlitt score of three to deny a patient anticoagulant therapy. And, you know, to remember when you talk about protection in patients with atrial fibrillation, you really have to think broadly. Patients don't want anything bad to happen. They, they don't want uh, a stroke, they don't want to have a heart attack, they don't want to use, lose a limb, they don't want to be on dialysis, they certainly don't want unnecessary bleeding um, from the medications you prescribe. Uh, so we do have to think about all of these things because our goal for our patient, Amin, is to have him come back in six months or a year and see us in clinic and to still be healthy and living independently. And when you prescribe a drug such as rivaroxaban, of course, we're doing it to prevent stroke, but there are a lot of other reasons why it's beneficial. We may slow the progression of renal disease. If they have diabetes, we may be preventing dialysis. We might be preventing a heart attack. We might be preventing an amputation. Um, we might be preventing stent thrombosis, et cetera. Uh, and so you have to incorporate all of that when you're making decisions about which therapy that you provide. And obviously there's a much more focus now on managing comorbidities in atrial fibrillation. We see here, obviously from the ESC, many of you are aware of this new ABC pathway really put forward by Gregory Lip in the UK, the A, anticoagulation, avoiding stroke, appropriate risk stratification, but the B and C is really managing the non-atrial fibrillation uh, stroke prevention piece, better symptom control, whether that's rate or rhythm control. And then the C is really critical to comorbidities. And I told you about some of them managing their diabetes, but of course, exercise, a weight loss, uh, reduction in alcohol use, smoking, et cetera. Um, and again, uh, this sort of is a nice picture, a nice uh, graphic to say, like, look at your patients with atrial fibrillation, look at all of the things that contribute to their risk. And you have to really think about all these things when you're managing um, that patient. And I would just like to end, I think, on an important topic that affects all of us, because, you know, the NOACs were first approved. Um, over 10 years ago, at least initially in the United States and then Europe and throughout the world. And we are now in an issue where we have four approved NOACs, not in every country in the world, but at least worldwide. Uh, and we're in an era where there are generics. And generics can be very good. Um, you know, certainly if rigorously tested, generics are often cheaper and as effective. And that's great because we know that cost is a big issue, not only for patients, um, but for the healthcare society at large. Uh, 
But we do have to be very careful that if we use genetic uh, generic drugs, that they've been appropriately tested and validated. And when you think about generics, we think about something at least in, when we talk about, say, the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S., which is a very rigorous definition for what's a therapeutically equivalent drug. It has to actually meet a couple of criteria. First, you have to be transparent and show that the new compound compared to your brand drug is pharmaceutically equivalent. What does that mean? Well, you have to say, does it have the same active drug in it? Is it the same dose, the route of administration? And does it meet all of the same standards that you have to go through to get a drug approved? Is it pure? Does it you know, have stability? Does it last the same in the bottle or on the shelves? And then you actually have to show that it's bioequivalent. And bioequivalent means like if you have a drug, you have to look at pharmacokinetic metrics. Does What's the area under the curve of the drug? How long does it inhibit factor 10 over 24 hours? Um, what's the elimination of the drug? So you have to do the normal drug testing that you have to do to get a drug approved. And then of course, you have to do a study that's showing that this generic drug is equivalent uh, clinically um, to this other drug. And just to give you an example, what you, what you generally would see is you would need to see some sort of study like this. First, you'd have to say, what's in the drug? Do we know that it's the same active ingredient? And then someone would have to actually do a pharmacodynamic study and say the area under the curve and drug of the, the red drug, which is the brand drug, is the same as the generic drug. And then you actually have to publish, um, you know, when you compare the generic drug to the innovative drug, um, is it similar? Um, and if they're not similar, um, then that's not a good generic. So just to, to warn you, we have this issue in the United States. I know it's, it's an issue throughout the world, including in Egypt, is if you are going to use a generic drug, which I'm all in, in favor for, if it's done appropriately, be very careful. Make sure that generic drug has undergone the appropriate testing and validity, because there's nothing worse than using a drug um, that's not effective or safe for your patients. Um, that's not something that we should be doing because these patients that we're caring for are at very high risk. And we want to make sure that we're using therapies that are going to protect their, their brain, that are going to protect their heart, and that are going to protect their limbs. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. And I'm happy to uh, take any, any questions. Sorry, I know we ran a little bit over in time, um, but, but more than happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Christian Ra, for uh, this uh, elegant presentation, uh, highly informative presentations uh, discussing a very important topic, uh, the safety of uh, NOAX, uh, especially the Rivaroxaban. First of all, I'd like uh, to apologize for the technical problem that uh, happened. It's the first time to uh, have it, unfortunately, so I apologize for that. Uh, I will start by uh, uh, talking about the risk of bleeding, because in the real world evidence uh, regarding the use of uh, NOAX, the issue is the bleeding risk. And we know that uh, patients who are at high bleeding risk at the same time, they are at uh, high thrombotic risk. So we have to, to balance uh, the risk versus the benefit in terms of reduction of a stroke and at the same time to avoid the bleeding risk. So uh, in the real world, uh, 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 evidence regarding uh, rivaroxaban uh, and the data of uh, uh, Xantos trial. How can a physician, uh, 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 when using rivaroxaban, the impact of uh, modifiable and non-modifiable bleeding risk? Patients who are elderly, who have eight heart failure, vascular disease, uh, and at the same time, hypertensive, maybe uncontrolled hypertension, so all these uh, factors increase the risk of bleeding and uh, the physicians are uh, 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 not using the optimal dose in such patients due to the risk of bleeding. So how can you use this uh, all uh, uh, risk factors in consideration when prescribing uh, NOAX, uh, in, uh, in, especially in elderly population? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I think you bring up an important point that the, the risk of bleeding is much more tightly correlated with the risk of the patient. I think Xanthus is a good example. Um, 
you know, obviously the, the rates of bleeding were higher in the rocket AF trial with rivaroxaban, say, than the Aristotle trial with apixaban. So there are two reasons for that. One, it could be there's a difference in the drugs. You know, there's more bleeding with rivaroxaban and apixaban, or it's just a difference in the patients. Um, well, if you look at the Xanthus trial, the, the rocket trial was a much higher risk trial than the Aristotle trial, which enrolled patients who could even have a chad vest score of zero to one. Um, the Xanthus trial, the trial, the criteria to get into that registry were actually very similar to the enrollment criteria for Aristotle. And so it's basically like look using rivaroxaban in an Aristotle-like trial population. And the results, the bleeding rates were very similar to what you saw in the Pixaban trial, which goes to show you your point in that your bleeding risk is much more related to your comorbidities than which 10A inhibitor you use. And I showed you the data from the Yao study that if you use the dose of, in this case, a Pixaban, that didn't affect the bleeding rates. So in patients who appropriately got the five milligrams or the 2.5, their major bleeding rates are the same. And so again, their bleeding risk was dictated by their risk factors for bleeding. And so I think you wanna use the appropriate dose of the anticoagulant. There is no difference, I think, in bleeding across um, the, the NOACs. And then, you know, if you wanna reduce bleeding, it's not by picking one NOAC over another um, or using a lower dose. It's, it's doing things to lower that patient's risk of bleeding, which are usually the modifiable things. Don't use aspirin or clopidogrel if you don't need to. Don't use NSAIDs if you don't need to modify their drinking, um, obviously controlling their hypertension. And so, you know, there's some things you can't control like their age and other things, but certainly there are a lot of other things that you could, you could do to lower their risk. I will even say, even if you take patients on a high Hazlitt score, have Hazlitt scores five uh, or higher, they still benefit from anticoagulation. Their risk of serious bleeding is still dramatically lower than their risk of having a stroke if you didn't prescribe an anticoagulant. Yeah, may I have a question, Professor Magdi, if you don't mind? Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, first, uh, thank you, Professor Roth, for this uh, interesting um, presentation. And sorry again for this technical issue, which is uh, out of our hand, I think. Uh, uh, my question is um, like a prospect question. It's about the use of uh, no X in patients who didn't have the approval yet. I mean, patients with prosthetic valves and patients with a valvular AF, I mean, AF with uh, tight or severe mitral stenosis. We, we have the evidence that uh, no acts, generally speaking, uh, prevents thromboembolic complications in patients with non-valvular AF. And we have uh, evidence that they are safe drugs. So they are effective, they are safe. So why not? I know that there are some running small trials at the moment uh, regarding use of those uh, of no acts, uh, I think particularly in uh, uh, mitral stenosis or in uh, some devices like uh, prosthetic mitral or aortic valve. What do you think the future and when we will be able to say it's safe to use those medications? In such yes, patients? it's a great question. You know, this non-valvular atrial fibrillation term is really unfortunate. It was actually a statistical term based on the FDA, because these they were all designed as non-inferiority trials. In the original warfarin versus placebo trials, it was an unethical to prescribe a patient with atrial fibrillation and mitral stenosis to placebo, because their risk of stroke isn't five times out of the general population, it's 20 times out of the general population. What was unknown in the 1990s was whether everyone with atrial fibrillation needed to be on a blood thinner. It turns out that 30% of the patients in the NOAC trials actually had moderate to severe valvular disease of all kinds, aortic stenosis, uh, mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation, at least mild mitral stenosis. Uh, these are high-risk patients, but the NOACs work just as well. And in fact, in two of the trials, both engaged with adoxaban as well as Aristotle with apixaban, allowed patients with bioprosthetic valves. Uh, and the data actually looked quite favorable in fact, both the FDA and EMA updated their guidance to say no acts are allowed in bioprosthetic valves. So the only patients who really should be excluded with valvular heart disease are mechanical heart valves. That's from a, a phase two trial with the bigotry and the realign trial that was stopped early due to increased thrombosis on the mechanical valve. And you, 
you can't use a 10A inhibitor or a 2A inhibitor on a mechanical valve because clotting on a mechanical surface is fundamentally different than clotting in the heart. But that is really the only contraindication to anticoagulation with a NOAC. The issue of mitral stenosis is actually more complicated. These drugs work great in patients with mild mitral stenosis. There's no reason to think it wouldn't work in patients with severe mitral stenosis. It's just that they weren't included. Because the mechanism of stroke in these patients is cardioembolic stroke from big left atriums. That's the same mechanism the same that mechanism. we're studying. So there's two different reasons. And, and, and there's a hard contraindication in mechanical heart valves because the drugs don't work. Well, mitral stenosis, it works fine in patients with mild to moderate mitral stenosis. We just never enrolled patients with severe mitral stenosis. And, and you know from clinical trials, unless you include those patients, it doesn't get into your label. So I have no problem using them in mitral stenosis. I'll, I'll just give you a caveat. There were patients with severe mitral stenosis that accidentally got into the study that we did, the ENGAGE study with the doxaban, uh, and the drug worked fine in them. So my own opinion is mitral stenosis, I, I have no problem using it no matter what their severity. What the caveat is that we don't have a trial in patients with severe mitral stenosis. There are studies being done, uh, which hopefully will inform us. Bioprosthetic valves, fine. Um, it's really the mechanical valves um, where you, you just, you cannot use it. Um, if you have a patient with a mechanical valve, you need to use um, warfarin. Although I will say there are new drugs in the pipeline, factor 11 inhibitors, which potentially could be used in, in mechanical heart valves, but we're still about five or so years from those drugs uh, completing phase three trials. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Cruz. Professor Ruff, based on uh, the interesting data uh, that you presented about the safety of uh, rivaroxaban in patients with uh, end-stage renal disease and dialysis, <coughs> so uh, uh, the question which is raised always, is it safe regarding the bleeding risk to be used in patients with uh, dialysis to give the... Uh, it is, yeah. I mean, again, we, we'd love to have a clinical trial in this area. People have tried to do clinical trials. They've enrolled very poorly. Um, and so it's been difficult. I will say we have very good real world data here. These US Medicare database is a very robust database. These are sick patients. They're over 75 on dialysis. And in every study that's been done with either rivaroxaban or pixaban, that there's a 20% at least decrease in major bleeding compared to warfarin. And so I don't think there's any great reason to be using warfarin in these patients, we know warfarin is very difficult to use in dialysis patients. Their time and therapeutic range is terrible. Um, and we, I showed you data that warfarin accelerates uh, renal decline. So whatever residual uh, renal function they have will deteriorate faster on warfarin. Um, and so with the caveat that we would love a randomized clinical trial, uh, I mean, I certainly in the U.S. where I realize we've been using it a lot more, I'm very comfortable. I have many patients on both a uh, rivaroxaban and a pixaban. And in fact, warfarin's so bad that many dialysis guidelines throughout the world don't even routinely recommend anticoagulation with warfarin because warfarin is just so difficult to use. And I will show you, there are large data bit bases out of the uh, Denmark, which you know has a very good uh, healthcare system that shows warfarin in dialysis patients doesn't even prevent strokes. Um, and so I think it, warfarin's terrible in dialysis patients. So I'm very comfortable using the 10A inhibitors. We have uh, two the questions. Very different throughout the world. So you have to take that into consideration. But in the US, at least our labels do allow its use. I have uh, two questions from the audience. Uh, practical questions, which can be answered quickly, Professor uh, Raf. One question related to, to patients who develop stroke while he's on rivaroxaban, how to handle the anticoagulation during and after, and patients who develop intracranial hemorrhage. Yeah, two great questions. How to manage. Yeah, the, the stroke question is a great question. One thing I would caution is, do not view a stroke on an anticoagulant as a failure. And remember, these drugs are effective, but they're only 80% effective. So they're not 100% effective. So patients can still have strokes, but just 80% less frequent. Also, there's a lot of data that the strokes these patients have while on an anticoagulant may not be cardioembolic. They obviously have other risk factors for stroke. And so it, it may not even be due to the atrial fibrillation. 
Um, now, what you do with the anticoagulant, it can be a little tricky. For small strokes, for TIA, um, we generally restart in 24 hours. For small strokes, we usually restart in three days. For large strokes, and by large strokes, I mean that you see hemorrhagic transformation, maybe on an MRI or some blood on a CT, we generally will wait uh, at least more than one week. Um, obviously, you could do that in consultation with, uh, with a neurologist. For intracranial hemorrhage, we are a little bit more cautious. Um, generally, a, a good rule of thumb um, is to wait four weeks before restarting anticoagulation and then repeat a CT scan after starting it to make sure there's been no expansion of the blood. Um, but I would say, you know, so in general, for small strokes, you're really waiting about three to seven days. Large strokes where you see blood on imaging, you're waiting two weeks, you know, 10 to 14 days. For intracranial hemorrhage, you're probably waiting at least four weeks, maybe six weeks. And again, in those patients, you're usually re-imaging uh, after starting therapy after a couple of days, just to make sure you see no more blood. Very difficult, very difficult to manage. But I would say don't, you see a lot of switching of medicines when a patient has a lot of stroke, make sure they're taking it. Uh, obviously if they're not taking it, they're not getting protected, but don't, don't view strokes as treatment failure. Uh, you know, keep in the back of your mind that they're 80% effective. That means 20% of strokes can still occur due to atrial fibrillation. And these patients have a lot of other reasons to have a stroke uh, that not due to atrial fibrillation. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Christian for uh, this uh, great discussion uh, and uh, excellent uh, presentation. So stay with us and uh, then we will... Uh, have another discussion regarding the use of uh, NOAX in uh, patients with uh, pulmonary embolism and uh, spe specifically cancer patients. So I have the pleasure uh, to introduce my dear friend, uh, Professor Ahmed Tag, uh, Professor of uh, Cardiology, Faculty of Medicine, uh, Swiss Canal University. Professor Ahmed is uh, one of the experts uh, in the field of uh, cardiovascular medicine in Egypt, uh, a very active uh, and uh, expert in the field of uh, electrophysiology, heart failure. So I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Ahmed to give his uh, presentation, which is uh, protecting patients uh, with pulmonary embolism. Professor Ahmed. Sorry, it seems I was uh, muted. <laughs> uh, so uh, once again, thank you very much, uh, Professor Magda Abdelhamid, uh, for this uh, very kind uh, intro about myself. And uh, I'm so proud of you, my dear mentor and senior colleague uh, with the uh, uh, international uh, uh, experience in heart failure. And uh, 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 we are going through your uh, national and international activities, which are a model for all uh, uh, cardiologists here in Egypt. Uh, so thank you uh, once more for this presentation, um, and I'd like to thank uh, uh, Pyre for uh, company for this uh, uh, summit, and of course the activities of the Heart Failure Working Group uh, of the Egyptian Society of Cardiology. So my topic today is about protecting patients with pulmonary embolism. Um, Again, uh, well, for uh, my colleague uh, Professor Ruff uh, presented the, what's the comprehensive definition of safety for patients with non-valvular AF. Uh, the use of uh, no X or uh, do X direct oral uh, anticoagulants or novel oral anticoagulants um, is not only for patients with atrial fibrillation for thromboembolic prevention. Uh, there is more uh, extended rule for those medications in patients with pulmonary embolism and with other thromboembolic disease. Uh, I wish uh, we can meet again, and uh, this is one of the uh, uh, historical places in Ismailia, my uh, country here in Egypt, and uh, this is one of the uh, important palaces for uh, the Khidewi Ismail, who is the founder of Ismailia. I wish there will be a chance to invite all attendees and uh, all colleagues, Professor Magdi and uh, Professor Roth, uh, uh, to visit us here in Ismailia. Uh, 
So let's start with Mr. Ayman. Uh, he is uh, 75 years old. He doesn't look so, actually he looks younger, but anyway, he's 75 year old gentleman, obese, and uh, he has uh, pulmonary embolism after recent flight. He has cancer prostate and uh, his creatinine clearance is 42 milli per minute. And uh, uh, actually he said that uh, I didn't know uh, a pulmonary embolism could be fatal. I feel totally out of control of this situation. Patients with unprovoked uh, and uh, non-surgical provoked venous thromboembolism uh, experience uh, have a very high risk of recurrence, even uh, after uh, treatment cessation. The risk of recurrence at two years is 20% in patients with unknown cause and 8% in patients with non-surgical cause. So Ayman has acute pulmonary embolism, cancer prostate, and his doctor prescribed him the conventional medications in the form of no molecular weight heparin, then overriding with uh, vitamin K antagonists. Traditional anticoagulants, uh, they have, uh, we know that they, they have benefits for use. However, they have some drawbacks. For unfractionated heparin, parenteral administration, monitoring, uh, and those adjustments required and sometimes uh, the frequency uh, of uh, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is, uh, in some patients, is high. Low molecular weight heparin, again, parenteral administration, and it has some weight-adjusted dosing and kidney-adjusting doses as well. Oral vitamin K antagonists, namely warfarin, uh, they have narrow therapeutic window interaction with food and drugs, frequent monitoring, and uh, those uh, adjustments required, actually, in many patients, you give him certain milligrams, I would say three milligram. His INR this week will be 2.5, which is fine. Next week, you might find it one. And maybe two weeks uh, later, you will find his INR four with some sort of bleeding. So this is what we call labile INR. You, you cannot predict INR for this patient. You cannot predict the uh, safety profile of patients on oral vitamin K antagonists because of so many interactions with drugs and foods. Actually, uh, VKAs, vitamin K antagonists, have narrow therapeutic window, which is difficult to keep within therapeutic range. And uh, as you see here, therapeutic range is, is, is actually uh, uh, so wide, uh, so narrow, sorry, with frequent INR monitoring, sometimes every two weeks, sometimes every week with those adjustments, multiple drug drug and food uh, drug interactions, slow onset and slow offset of action and increased risk of bleeding. So although they are effective, we know they are effective. However, in some patients, there is some sort of high risk of bleeding. And again, there is a high risk of labile NR going down, so there will be a high risk of thromboembolism as well. So the proposed uh, uh, perfect formula or properties of ideal anticoagulant that it's orally administered, which is convenient, wide therapeutic window, so broad safety and larger efficacy, low risk of food and drug interactions, and this is very important, predictability, which means that you give the patient the drugs so you know that it's effective and you know as well that it's safe especially after adjusting all comorbid conditions and chemical profile of your patients. No monitoring. Frequent monitoring actually is, is very, uh, uh, I would say, um, difficult for patient and caregiver. They have to go once a week or once every two weeks, the patient and someone with them to do uh, the lab. Sometimes if the uh, sample uh, taken very fastly, or there is any technical problem with the sample, they call him or her once again to have another sample. So sometimes this makes life difficult for patients. And fixed doses, which is good because some patients, they took three milligram of warfarin and after two or three weeks, we can go up, up to seven milligram because of INR is not stable. And then in six weeks, we might go down again to two milligram. Patients themselves cannot understand why this is happening. And sometimes they are confused how and uh, this week I took two milligram, and then after a few weeks I took seven milligram, and vice versa. And this is uh, uh, was uh, challenging and was warranting uh, 
a new concept of oral uh, anticoagulants, which called novel oral anticoagulants, which work on uh, uh, factor 10, activated factor 10 or activated factor 2. So we have uh, 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 direct uh, oral anticoagulants working on fact activated factor 10, like uh, rivaroxaban, apixaban, and we have others who work on activated factor 2, like the bigatron. So, going back to Mr. Ayman, after one year, he developed another PE, pulmonary embolism. And pulmonary embolism is one of the thromboembolic uh, diseases that uh, when they come once, they might come more than one. Uh, so, usually, it's not just one attack. And you cannot expect when will be the other attack. So, now, his doctor switched him to rivaroxaban and was asking if injection should be given to him before the rivaroxaban. And to, to answer this question, we have this important uh, slide showing that for onset of action, for peak of action, and for continuous action and fading off, they look like same. I mean, rivaroxaban and enoxaparin. Enoxaparin is one of the very efficacious treatments for patients with uh, pulmonary embolism, uh, uh, it's parenteral uh, heparin, uh, low molecular weight one, and when it was 40 milligram was compared with 10 milligram of rivaroxaban, they look, I mean, in the function wise, in the beak, in the onset of action, which is after 10 minutes, uh, like the same. So there is no need actually to give injection before giving rivaroxaban. So usually we stop vitamin K antagonist, we measure INR. If INR is 2.5 or less, you can directly give rivaroxaban immediately. If INR is more than 2.5, just repeat the test in three or four days. Possibly it will go down and then you can give again rivaroxaban. In Einstein pulmonary embolism trial, uh, rivaroxaban was the only novel uh, oral anticoagulant to confirm early clot regression following acute pulmonary embolism. So in all patients who received Rivaroxaban uh, twice uh, daily for 21 days, 15 milligram twice daily for 21 days, no worsening of pulmonary impulse uh, realized. And it was at the same initial presentation in 12% and in 88%, it's either totally or partially regressed, which is very good actually. So when the highest risk of vena thromboembolism recurrence is expected after acute event. So if any patient, Mr. X, Mr. Y, they had venous thromboembolism. When I, as a physician, expect that there will or there might be a recurrence for venous thromboembolism. And the answer is that the highest recurrence is in the first three to four weeks because the patient usually is uh, hospitalized at least for the first week. Uh, they are not uh, mobile as they should be. Uh, because of the fear of the dislodgement of the thrombus if it is very large. Uh, and usually they, they are in a state uh, that they are more prone to have a vena thrombosis. However, this risk extends over uh, weeks and uh, uh, days, so to be still there with less frequency, but is still there even over uh, four months after the acute event. So that's why rivaroxaban dosage is covering the first three weeks with 15 milligram twice daily to protect patients against venous thromboembolism recurrence. As you all know, in patients with atrial fibrillation, the dose of rivaroxaban is either 20 milligram once daily or 15 milligram once a daily, and in some patients, 10 milligram once a daily, according to the bleeding risk profile and the frailty of the patient as well. But in venous thromboembolism or acute pulmonary uh, uh, embolism, uh, uh, we can give rivaroxaban 15 milligram twice daily for the first three weeks. Then we can shift from the day 22 up to uh, uh, whichever uh, time we decide according to the patient profile to 20 milligram once daily taken with food. It's important for this drug to be well absorbed to be taken with food. And as regarding creatinine clearance, there is no dose adjustment till the dose, uh, till creatinine clearance of more than 15. So if it is less than 15, the use of rivaroxaban is not recommended. So can we give rivaroxaban for fragile patients? 
namely patients above age of uh, uh, 65 uh, year old uh, with uh, impairment of kidney function or body weight less than uh, 60 or 50 kilograms. For this patient of 75 years old and with creatinine clearance of 42 milli per minute. Actually, in all drugs we give, usually we have two important questions to ask about any medication. Is it effective? And if it is effective, is it safe or not? Sometimes efficacy come on the account of safety and vice versa. So for drug to be very safe, possibly the efficacy will not be very good because to be very safe, so no side effects, so possibly the efficacy of the drug is not 100% as we are expecting. And sometimes some medications are very effective. However, they are not safe. So for example, here, when we ask about efficacy, we ask about prevention of thromboembolism, clot regression, or the solvent at all, and recurrent uh, venous thromboembolism or recurrent events. When we talk about safety, we talk about GI bleeding, major bleeding, minor bleeding, intracranial hemorrhage, fatal and non-fatal hemorrhage. So some medications efficacy come on the account of safety, and sometimes safety come on the account of efficacy. And for a drug to be marvelously working, there will be a very good balance between safety and efficacy. Let's go back to uh, rivaroxepin, which is safe and effective drug. So here in patients uh, with uh, uh, age more than 75 year old, creatinine clearance less than 50 milliliter per minute, and with low body weight less than 50 kilogram, those patients are labeled, labeled typically frail patients or fragile patients. They are more vulnerable to major bleeding and fatal bleeding. And again, they are more vulnerable for venous thromboembolism and thromboembolic complications. So, rivaroxaban was very uh, uh, medication when uh, uh, compared to anoxaparin in terms of major bleeding. So, uh, they are uh, so safe medications with relative risk reduction of major bleeding of about 73%, which is considered a hazard ratio of uh, 27, which is actually a very uh, good one. And if we look about his creatinine, again, as I said before, uh, there is no considerations of those adjustment uh, uh, up to uh, 29 and 15, even milliliter per minute of creatinine clearance. And it's contraindicated when uh, creatinine clearance is less than 15. Einstein, DVT, and BE Bold analysis uh, uh, revealed that uh, uh, rivaroxaban is very effective in patients with normal kidney function and even with certain degree of renal impairment. So it's a safe, again, and effective drug. Uh, when we say it's a safe, so the recurrence of VTE is not that much. When we say it's safe, this means no risk of major bleeding. So as you see here, even with low creatinine clearance, still effective and there is no recurrent of VTE. And for the next slide, for this slide, even in with impairment of kidney function, still there is no high level of major bleeding. So safety, sorry, uh, efficacy and safety, they are balanced. So it's a good drug for these post issues. What about cancer? Recurrence of VTE in patients with cancer is two to nine times higher than in patients without cancer. So patients in cancer status, they have some sort of systemic inflammatory response due to presence of cancer, which make their coagulation profile very vulnerable, and the VTE recurrence is up to nine times higher, which is very large number, uh, actually, uh, if we consider this. So effective treatment uh, in pulmonary embolism and DVT in patients with active cancer with significant reduction in major bleeding, which means that it's effective treatment and safe treatment in frail patients and in patients with cancer, uh, as I explained uh, before. So when compared to anoxaparin, one of the effective drugs in prevention and management of uh, BE, pulmonary embolism and DVT, still uh, when compared to, to rivaroxaban, is still a safe drug and very effective as well. 
this is select D phase three pilot study. Uh, uh, delta perine, again, one of the low molecular weight heparins widely used in the UK uh, for the treatment of cancer associated from collection. And you can clearly see that uh, uh, there is a decrease in V57 person. This is actually a uh, very uh, 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 highly significant uh, uh, number. So as regarding efficacy and safety, usually they go together, efficacy and safety. It's very effective, so reduced recurrence by 57%, and it's safe, actually, as regarding the major or fatal bleeding. Select the initial trial proved that there is no incidence of VTE in rivaroxaban versus delta brim by 57%. Same rates of major bleeding after this trial, uh, uh, there was a change in the guidelines, as you know, uh, rivo uh, rivaroxaban or edoxapan should be considered as an alternative to low molecular weight heparin, with exception of patients with gastrointestinal cancer. Why? Because this is orally uh, a rooted drug. So if there, is the, if there is a cancer in the gut, which is the cancer stomach, uh, 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 colon uh, cancer, so this might affect the absorption of the medication. So uh, uh, for patients with cancer, for treatment and prevention of thromboembolism, pulmonary embolism, VTE, you can use rivaroxaban as class 2A, which is, should be, and this is a very good class, by the way, except in patients with GIT cancer. The uh, International Society of Thrombosis and Homeostasis Guidance recommends rivaroxaban for treatment of CAT, which is cancer-associated thrombosis. A specific monax like edoxaban or rivaroxaban are first option for cancer patients with acute VTE, again, except for GI cancer. Uh, there is low risk of bleeding and there is very effective uh, prevention of VTE and thromboembolism with these medications. So what if we would like to extend Ayman uh, anticoagulation? Because he has one attack of PE, he was treated with the conventional therapy, he had another one in one year, so change it to uh, uh, rivaroxaban. So should we continue for longer time or not? He is obese, he has pulmonary uh, embolism twice now, he has cancer prostate and he has some sort of impairment of kidney function. According to the European Society of Cardiology guidelines at 2019, um, um, no identifier if uh, after acute pulmonary embolism, uh, recommended extension of therapy in patients with no identifiable risk factors, because if there is no risk factor for pulmonary embolism, so the likelihood of recurrence is still there. Number two, for persistent and minor transient reversible risk factors, because sometimes this is as initiative for pulmonary embolism. Recommendation for rivaroxaban consider reduced dose for extended anticoagulation after the first six months of treatment. And this is Einstein uh, uh, ex uh, extension trial and Einstein choice trial, which with them, they proved that uh, there is uh, relative uh, risk reduction of 82% uh, enduring protection against recurrent VTE. Uh, recurrent vena thromboembolism was reduced by 82%. This is very high relative risk reduction ratio uh, uh, of uh, rivaroxaban versus placebo. And again, major bleeding, minor bleeding, and all other uh, uh, bleeding, uh, uh, of course, for placebo, uh, uh, it was zero, uh, and for uh, rivaroxaban, still it was a saved medication. Uh, Einstein choice evaluated rivaroxaban versus aspirin for extended treatment of venous thromboembolism. Uh, Again, uh, it's a very safe and effective drug, even with 20 milligram or with 10 milligram of rivaroxaban, uh, extended over about one year. Uh, index VTE was uh, 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 pulmonary embolism in 34% of patients. So both rivaroxaban doses were more effective than aspirin at reducing the recurrence of uh, vena thromboembolism rate with a similar risk of bleeding. So as regarding safety, they are safe as 
uh, uh, aspirin is safe. As regarding efficacy, they are more effective in reducing pulmonary impulse uh, uh, with significant risk, relative risk reduction. So according to the guidelines, if there is major transient provoked uh, venous thromboembolism or pulmonary embolism, for example, after major surgery, this is a low risk of recurrence. But the risk of recurrence is very high if it is persistent, provoked, for example, active cancer. So for patients with cancer, they must be actually anticoagulated for prevention of future thromboembolism. For patients who have 3 to 8% intermediate risk, like unprovoked or may minor transient provoked, the risk of recurrence is still high. So patients with unprovoked and provoked VTE benefit from extended with, with either uh, uh, rivaroxaban uh, versus aspirin or placebo. Rivaroxaban treatment and dosing regimen Initially, 50 milligram twice daily. This is usually for 21 days. Then 20 milligram for six months. And this is called continued treatment uh, to prevent recurrence of venous thromboembolism. Then you have to assess the patient to see whether the risk is very high. So you have to give him or her 20 milligram once daily or the risk is intermediate or uh, assessment of the bleeding risk. If bleeding risk is very high, you have to go for the lower dose, of course. And this is called extended treatment. So ESCC uh, guidelines, if extended oral anticoagulation is desired after, decided after pulmonary embolism in patient without cancer, a reduced dose of aroxamine is 10 milligrams, should be considered after six months of therapeutic anticoagulation. If the patient has active cancer, so the likelihood is more high, so we have to give 20 milligram once daily. So this is the guidance. Patients who receive continuously uh, administered uh, parenteral drugs such as IV heparin or subcutaneous uh, rivaroxaban or Zalerto should be started at the time of discontinuation. Patients who receive a parenteral drug on a fixed dosing scheme like low molecular weight heparin, again, should be started zero to two hours before the time of next scheduled administration. Patients who receive uh, Zalerto uh, uh, and are uh, converted to parenteral anticoagulation, the first dose of the parenteral drug uh, should be administered uh, instead of the next Zalerto dose at the blend time. Uh, so the uh, bleeding management protocol uh, uh, are uh, currently in place. If there's minor bleeding, consider delaying or discontinuing the next dose. If there's major bleeding, patient should be hospitalized uh, symptoms and local measures like mechanical compression, general volume management, uh, like maintain diuresis or sometimes to give blood constitutes transfusion. If it's life-threatening, uh, a special hemostasis uh, uh, management, consider coagulation factor products like uh, packed uh, 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 platelet uh, concentrates uh, or activated factor uh, 7, uh, or sometimes we can give adenoxinib, but uh, I think it's not available in here in Egypt. Uh, uh, patients treated uh, with uh, uh, no X uh, who require uh, surgery, if this elective surgery stop no X for uh, 24 or 48 hours, and then do the surgery. If this emergency, we have to assess the uh, relative risk and benefit for the patient. If patients no bleeding uh, and is expected, you can uh, don't use PCC. Uh, if the patient have severe bleeding, you have to use. Uh, a platelet uh, concentrate. So this is regimen for VTE, twice daily, 15 milligram of rivaroxaban for 21 days. Then from the 22nd, uh, and then uh, for up to six months, you can use 20 milligram. Extension B and six months for patients with cancer or high risk for VTE or pulmonary embolism, 20 milligram. Low risk, 10 milligram. No dose adjustment except less than 15 milliliter of per minute creatinine clearance, uh, we, we shouldn't use rivaroxaban. So my take home message, uh, Mr. Chairman, Professor Magda Abdel Hamid, I'm uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Raf. Um, um, patients with pulmonary embolism are offered more protection with rivaroxaban than other medications on the level of VTE recurrence and bleeding. Patients compliance is better with single dose than injection. Rivaroxaban is indicated as first option 
uh, uh, for management of cat or cancer uh, associated uh, uh, thrombosis except for GI cancer. Uh, cancer associated venous thromboembolism is frequent, sometimes life threatening, and coagulation are cornerstone for management. Randomized control trials proved that uh, rivaroxaban as one of the do X is very effective medication. Thank you very much, and uh, uh, coming back to Professor Magdi Abdelhamid. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Ahmed, uh, for this uh, elegant presentation. As usual, uh, very important topic, uh, management of uh, pulmonary embolism, which is a life-threatening condition, seen commonly in the daily practice. I have uh, two questions, uh, Dr. Ahmed. The first question is the uh, home treatment of uh, patients with pulmonary embolism. According to the uh, last trial, which have been presented in the, uh, the AC last meeting uh, uh, regarding the hot uh, PE treatment. Uh, so, uh, no X for uh, low risk patients. Uh, who should be treated uh, at home without uh, uh, complications of hospitalizations and uh, with uh, the outcome for those patients is uh, more or less the same as uh, uh, management in the hospital. What do you think about uh, this strategy for uh, low-risk patients? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for this uh, uh, important question. Um, I think home management of pulmonary embolism um, will reduce the risk of uh, hostile acquired infections or complications and will reduce the burden on the CCU or ICU admissions. However, this should be considered in the context of patients' education and patients' uh, orientation to the uh, severity of the disease. Initially, the patient should be evaluated very well clinically and uh, by uh, imaging to make sure that he is a low risk uh, uh, pulmonary uh, embolism patient without affection to the heart and without a great uh, infarcted area of the lung with good oxygen saturation, uh, this number one. So we have to make sure at least, uh, I, would, I would go for at least two consultants independently. They should make the decision, not only one, because sometimes uh, uh, two eyes is better than one eye, as we say. Um, so this number one. Number two, we have to uh, health educate the patient and the patient family as regarding developing of any signs that the, the pulmonary embolism transform it from low risk to high risk, like uh, cyanosis, like shortness of breath, like uh, a drop of uh, oxygen saturation, because they should have pulse oximetry. I would, I would go for that, actually, if the patient is, is high risk overall global risk, obese patient, cancer patient, uh, the current VTE. Uh, so we, we should be ready uh, to accept the patient again to our facility, hostel facility, if there is any uh, complication. So the patient himself and the patient informant uh, uh, should uh, be very well oriented to the uh, 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 poor signs or important signs that we should call ambulance to come back. So. It's, it's reasonable to use this and to use even rivaroxaban uh, 50 milligram twice daily uh, for 21 days. However, we should make sure that there is no high risk criteria for those patients. Professor Magdi. So uh, the second question, uh, we know that uh, pulmonary embolism could be due to hypercoagulable state. So do we have data about the use of uh, Novax, rivaroxaban, for example, in patients with hypercoagulable state? Yeah, according to my knowledge, uh, for any patients who developed uh, pulmonary embolism, he should be treated first as the conventional uh, treatment strategy. Uh, if he has massive pulmonary embolism, for example, uh, they should be hospitally admitted. If there is any chance for uh, thrombectomy, we can do that. If there is no, and the patient is uh, uh, decompensated, he should be either mechanically ventilated or CPAP or whatever, and they should uh, be given the parenteral uh, medications, and then we can go for the oral medications uh, uh, if he's stable. If he's from the start, uh, is not uh, in a big mess, uh, 
uh, we can uh, still use uh, uh, rivaroxaban uh, twice daily, 15 milligram. And then after uh, uh, the transition to after 21 days, and then we will go with the patients for 20 milligram once daily for six months, we can assess whether there is hypercoagulable state as the cause of pulmonary embolism or not. Because if there is any um, uh, provocable uh, uh, or risk factors that is recoverable, so possibly there is no uh, evidence of hypercoagulable state. If there is no risk factors at all, we have to search for that. Uh, if there are any specific study uh, for use of rivaroxaban in those patients in particular, I, I, I myself, I have no idea, maybe the medical team uh, of uh, Pyre uh, tell us, or uh, if you have any idea, Professor Magdi to tell me, uh, but any, anyhow, it, it's effective drug in management of pulmonary embolism, whatever uh, the cause, because it will stop uh, the activated factor XA. So it will go with it. Uh, if the patient on the treatment developed a vena thromboembolism, I think we have to, uh, to, to search more about the hypercoagulable state. Professor, the final question uh, from the audience, the, how to shift from uh, low molecular weight heparin uh, or VKA to uh, NOAC? Uh, how to shift from low molecular weight heparin to NOAC? Uh, to NOAC, the next dose of low molecular weight heparin, before the next dose by zero to two hours, we can give uh, low molecular, uh, sorry, uh, rivaroxaban, and then we give it uh, on daily basis. If it is uh, uh, unfractionated heparin, immediately we can give cysate the next dose and give uh, rivaroxaban immediately. Professor Magdi? Yeah, yeah, great. Just, uh, just a my... point uh, uh, about the uh, patients with hypercoagulable state. Uh, thank you, Professor Ahmed and Professor Magdi. Uh, as you have said, that there is not a specific clinical trial for those patients, uh, but they were included by somehow of about 6 to 7% in the uh, Einstein DVT and PE trials. But till now, there is not a specific trial for them. The only thing which is not indicated for NOACs is patients with antiphospholipid syndrome. So we are dealing with them like the moderate to severe mitral stenosis or the mechanical heart valve indicated only for warfarin and not for NOAX. Just to uh, to highlight on this thing. And thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. And this is a very good uh, piece of knowledge for me. Thank you, Dr. Shreef. My pleasure. Thank you. I think Dr. Raf, uh, uh, leave us a message that no, he... Think... Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, I think we covered uh, everything uh, related to uh, the use of uh, NOAX uh, in patients with uh, non-valvular HF fibrillation as well as uh, in patients with uh, pulmonary embolism. So uh, at the end of uh, this uh, successful uh, webinar, uh, I'd like uh, to thank Professor Rahmat Tag, uh, Professor Christian Ruff for the excellent presentation, uh, for uh, great lectures, uh, fruitful discussions, discussion uh, and uh, I'd like to thank also uh, Fire Company for the invitation and uh, sponsoring this uh, webinar. Thanks for the all attendees uh, who participated uh, today in uh, this uh, uh, challenging uh, topics uh, and the interactive uh, discussion with the great uh, lecturers. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, see you soon. Yeah, yeah so very soon. <laughs> Inshallah, very soon. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for Pyre team and for uh, Dr. Ruff uh, and uh, for my uh, mentor and senior colleague, Professor Magda Abdelhamid. Thank you. And for all attendees, of course, thank you very much for being with us uh, till 11 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sharif.